this video, the middle-aged nerds discuss spoilers from books they read decades ago. Do you really need a spoiler alert? Do you really? Hi, I'm Bill, also known as Matt Stagger. And I'm the Geeky Hippie. Welcome back to non Trustal Half-Life, the YouTube channel that rereads books we read in the first time in the first half of our life. This week, we're finishing up with Janny Wirtz and Raymond E. Feist's Empire Trilogy with Mistress of the Empire. And to help us close this trilogy out, we brought in the closer, Jim. We've had hey, him on hey. the other channel a lot. Welcome back, Jim. Or welcome, Jim. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing really well, and it's great to be with you on this channel now and yes. uh, to close yet another trilogy. Yep, sounds good. <laughs> Fitting good. Closing on so, both channels. It's a cleanup hitter. Yeah. <laughs> He is the closer. So we always start with a first time person, you know, first time guest. We we don't start right in on the book. We have a first timer's question. And that's when did you first discover you loved books? And what books do you think led to that? And do you know how old you were when that happened? This was a fun question to have to ponder and think about. Because <laughs> man, I'm old now. So wow, way back. You know, I've always loved books as far back as I can go. I know I was an advanced reader, so I was into books already in preschool. Um, a couple of early memories I have are in first grade reading Jaws, you know, Peter Benchley's mm. Jaws. Wow. Because my mom had a okay. bookshelf full of paperbacks and I was free to read anything I felt like. She really was an encourager of my reading. Now, I didn't totally understand Jaws, but I read it, <laughs> you know, so I remember that. I also remember my uh, stepdad back at that time trying to read to me. Now, this is like a year earlier. I'm in kindergarten, first grade, somewhere right around there. He's trying to read a bedtime story to me, and I keep correcting him on words he's doing wrong. <laughs> and he got so nice. mad. And boom, that was the last time he read that I remember this, you know, because I was just into books. That was my thing. Um, I couldn't get enough reading. So, you know, what kinds of things, what books led me into a love for reading? You know, I I got into very early uh, The Wizard of Oz. All 14 mm. books uh, by L. Frank Baum. There's a whole series yep. and you just lose yourself in this fantasy world. So that's one I, I definitely remember early. I also, um, our family had a donation of books. Uh, these were uh, Time Life books. Mm. Big books with pictures on things like mammals, the oceans, you know, and, and I would read these from front to back and just so nonfiction. I was sucking down information. It really helped playing trivia games in the future. Uh, the other thing I can say definitely was a gateway into the kinds of fantasy that is my jam really now uh, was the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. I got into those pretty early. And I've read them yeah. multiple times. And then eventually I went on to be a teacher and I was in a Christian school so I could read these to my students and note yep. the mm. allegories that are intentionally in there. But ah, gotcha. just good fantasy. You don't have to be a Christian to enjoy the Chronicles no. of Narnia. No. No, those absolutely really not. Were, those really probably were what introduced me to fantasy. Um, I had read them several times through all seven books. In the old publication, in the old order, you know, which is different than the order you get them as a box set nowadays. And yeah, hashtag, I remember asking hashtag my mom, bring back the beginning. Come on. Yeah, I remember <laughs> being like seven years old, asking my mom for more fairy tales because I didn't know what else to call it. You know, it, mm -hmm. it, it, there, there were no fairies in there, but I, I had no idea. What, you know, fantasy as a genre was not something that my seven-year-old brain had, you know, pondered. Sure. And she handed me The Hobbit which did not work didn't work a little young i got little like young. yeah i got about three or four pages in nope went back and reread the chronicles of narnia again and by the time i finished that and tried the hobbit again i managed to get through the hobbit and then plowed through the lord of the rings at about the age of eight and yep i never looked yeah. back very oh. <laughs> similar ages for me for for the uh, chronicles of narnia but i know something else i got into at that age was greek mythology yeah. You know, it was a kind of fantasy, basically. Yeah. And uh, there was a yeah. scholastic version of Greek mythology that uh, I enjoyed. It just kind of made them as little short stories. Have you uh, read the Percy Jackson series? <laughs> yes. Yes, I have. Just I have, too. Book. Don't be embarrassed. 
no, no, I got no. My kids I, I'm laughing that, because Zach and I on our channel, Fantasy for the Ages, we talk about this a lot. He loves the Percy Jackson series. Mm. And I only read the first book and went, mm, it's not my thing. Uh, I was I, it gets I better. wasn't the target it, it audience anymore. And and it felt that way. So that's all. Have so he loves it and I poke yet? fun at him for it. So <laughs> have any of you watched the show yet? No, I I've have. heard it's good. First couple episodes I've watched. Um, have you liked I, it? Haven't watched it. Yes, actually, a lot better than the movies. Okay, that's aligning with what I'm hearing. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah I think uh, that then. for me, um, it started when I was around 10, 11 years old. Uh, I picked up a uh, Louis L'Amour Western, and that's where it started oh, for me. My dad loved um, on, those. On a road trip, and I was bored out of my mind, so I picked that. It happened to be in the car. Fell in love with those. And then I, I found the Xanth novels by Pierce Anthony. Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. I would go back and forth between Western and fantasy. And that's when my dad handed me the gunslinger and said, I think you're going to like this. Oh, you I was a done. good dad, man. I was wow. done. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. Gunslinger. So yeah. That's what really sucked me in with Stephen King's The Gunslinger. And uh, yeah, I know you recently finished a reread on that. Just finished on a reread. For oh, the ages. Man. The Dark Tower is so much better on a reread. It's it good is. the first time, but you appreciate so much more. Oh. I, I love the I ending, and I've I don't been... care what anybody says. I will die on that hill. <laughs> I think Just I've saying. been roped into reading at least the first few of those, you know, for this channel. Uh, we just need to find a guest who read those in their first half of their life and have them come on. Well, so oh, that I'll find somebody. My, my original read was the first half. And well, I, I read I them as they came out. To to. I mean, yeah, they're I'll, I'll good. Do, I'll be reading them for the first time, and Bill will be doing a reread. So I've been well, trying so know. hard to get more Stephen King on this channel. <laughs> yeah, and I've been telling Bill we need more stuff that he's read that I haven't when we have guests on. So now to Mistress of the Empire. Like I said, Jenny Wirtz, Raymond E. Feist. Do you guys remember the first time you read this? Well, Jim, do you remember the first time you read this all those years Me? Ago? I remember like it was yesterday. Because <laughs> it was yesterday when I put this. It was a long time ago I read it. Uh, it would fit into the category of things I was doing in the late 90s. I know it came mm, out, I think, right. in 92. So it wasn't brand yeah. new when I got to it. Because I had just found and read the Rift War saga. And then this mm. is what flows next. So I just moved. Yep. I was reading everything that, you know, existed in the series to that point. So it was it was late 90s when I read it. Yeah, I think I got into it right after it came out. This was one of the first series that I came into the first book after it had been out for a while. But I was waiting for book two and book three. I actually, okay. didn't, not so much waiting because probably didn't even realize at the time that there was another book coming. You know, I just remember all of a sudden it's there at the library or it was on that month's list of uh, books for the science fiction book club. Do you remember anybody remember that? I oh, remember. Yeah. Yep. Me too. I got a whole bunch of books around here, then t including yep. this entire trilogy. Um, I think that's where I got this. This trilogy was through that. Um, now, but I, I, might I have do read have a question it from the library related to that. Then, of course, this continues on with the rest of the Rift War uh cycle yes. have you guys read the rest of the cycle all of it but no, bill for... it's on your to-do nope. to list now right yeah <laughs> yeah yeah if we get to it i mean we have so much ahead of us it's insane what are we doing next uh i don't even we remember do stranger we, we've put stranger on hold possibly and then i think after yeah. that tale of two cities actually with Mitch. Oh, wow. Classic. Oh, that's right. We are doing uh, Tale of Two Cities. I think that's coming up next after Stranger in a Strange Land. I'd have awesome. I already have that one. So, Well, and after this book, there's only 23 more books in the Rift War. Uh, oh, that's cycle. all? Yeah. Yeah. That's oh. it. I've read all of it except for, <laughs> and I don't even know if it's fiction or like an in-world atlas, but uh, Midchemia, it, it just pugged the Chronicles of of mid or something like that it's mm. like the 30th book but it's like a coffee table book. what i'll say okay. wasn't that a coffee table book I yeah that's not part yeah. of the narrative yeah I, I yeah i don't know what's the content of that is but that's the only thing rift war related that i have not read i mean i've even read fight's new trilogy that he's written which might or might not be related somehow to 
this universe. Okay. It's, I haven't it's read the newest. I understood he was like, I'm finally done with that. Okay, now I'm going to write something I, brand new, but you're saying it might have a tie-in? I, ha I have reason to believe mm -hmm. there might be a connection. Okay. That, that, that's all I'll say. <laughs> I, I don't want to give any spoilers. Right, no, I have reason to believe there's a connection. You know, but... So... All right, let me see here. We got that. What were your memories of reading this book, Jim? For me, well, I have to admit, I didn't love this trilogy the first time I read it. No, uh, mm -hmm. it took some time for me to come to appreciate it, and, and that was because I had just finished the Rift War saga, and this is such a jarring shift from the style and focus of those first three slash four books, depending on right. how you look at it. Right. Um, and I wasn't prepared for it. It's like, that's not what I was looking for. Now, they're brilliant, this second trilogy. But at the time, I was like, OK, I'm going to power through these and then get back to because, again, there were already more books in the series waiting when I found it. So power through these and get back to the good stuff was my mindset. Gotcha. But it has uh, aged well. I, that's a different thing we'll talk about. But as I look back on it and then on the reread, oh, yeah, much, much better. I didn't give it the credit that it was due at the time I first read it. I expected to hate this because I'm not a big fan of uh, politics. Um, in fiction, a lot of times it can just bore me to death when there's. What I've learned after reading this particular series is I'm not a fan of badly written politics in books. It just <laughs> bores me to death. I love these and I did not expect to. I told Glenn going into this when he he kind of told me there's a lot of politics. I'm like, oh, I'm either going to love this or absolutely hate it. And I love this. So, yeah. And this yeah. book included, honestly, I enjoy better than the second book. Um, mm -hmm. If I had to rate them, I'd probably say one, three, two for me. So oh, see. that's my that's order for this two. trilogy. Or just I, to throw I, out I'm there. Two, one, three, I mean. I'm and two, I'm one, three. three one two, which was my original so, area, area code growing up in Chicago. But anyways, man. yeah, three one two would be me. Mine's we three two one because we launch rockets in Florida. Uh, three two. One. I fell in love with this trilogy really quickly. <laughs> I, I I wasn't I I wasn't as angry about the culture as I was this past reread. I, I'm not sure exactly why it bothered me so much, why the Sarani bothered me so much more now at the age of 49, 50, you know, when we've been reading the stuff on this channel than it ever did before. But the politics nature sucked me right in. It was, I, I, I loved it because it, it was a world unlike any other fantasy world I'd read it, you know, up to this point, you know, when, you know, early 90s. Everything was, you know, the, the stereotypical European, medieval Europe clone. Western Europe, you know, yep. yep. Yep, always. That, you know, that, that fantasy is making a lot of strides to get away from, you know, but it can still be done well, even yeah, within, yeah. you know, that model. Um, but it was something very new and different for me, you know, when it comes to, you know, to the types of fantasy I'd been reading. Mostly, I, you know... The other Feist stuff, you know, I was reading a lot of David Eddings, you know, the, the Bulgarian and the Malorian mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the Elenium and the Tamuli and all of that, which I'd hope to, hope to do someday on this channel, maybe. I haven't read those in a long time. I'm going to read them on my own if we don't do them on here. But, yeah, I, I remember falling in love with this, and I think this was the first female-led fantasy that I'd read. I'd read female-led stories before, but I don't know because I, I had read the Harper Hall of Pern trilogy. Yeah, I was going to say, I'd read Pern before this. Yeah, but so, that's technically sci-fi. It's sci shared. I mean, it, yeah, I can understand why somebody uh, would say fantasy. Sci-fi is I fantasy mean, as right, far as I'm concerned. Yeah. It's the fantastical nature of science. It's still fantasy. So right. They, they both the, fit this, under the umbrella. It, in Pern, it has dragons that teleport so that that's kind of fantastical if you ask me but outside of 
mentally in the Harper Hall of Pern trilogy, I think Mara was the first female character in genre fiction that I'd read. You know, it, and it wasn't too odd for me to have read that because, you know, I had read all of uh, Louisa May Alcott's stuff when I was a kid, too, early teens. You know, I read all of that stuff, you know. But this was something that I hadn't seen in science fiction or fantasy, and, I, and it really mm. just sucked me in a lot. Now, I'd well, already I mean, read a number of Wheel of Time books before I got to this one. So a lot of right. prominent lead women in, in that series as well. So I didn't have that experience so much. But I was just happy to have a competent female in the Rift War saga because in the first trilogy, there really aren't <laughs> any well written women, which was no. my big complaint was <laughs> okay, we got some like cardboard cutouts, is what I call them, of women in the first trilogy. So I was rather what, you surprised didn't just that... love uh, Carol, uh, what's her name? Carol. You can't even remember her name, thank you, Caroline. <laughs> well, you're supposed to not like her in that trilogy. <laughs> well, I don't. I mean, eventually you kind of warm on her, but anyways, sorry. Yeah. Tangent. Yeah. No, you're, tangent you're right. is what this show does. If I'm on the show, we do tangents. <laughs> That's fair. Bill has to edit around them. <laughs> but yeah, Mara, she's a strong character. Flawed, she's my number one. You know, because of the culture she's growing up in. And, but, and you know, this surpassing book. Her flaws in right. that in that sense. There, there's some interesting things to this character. Some great growth. Where she I love that we see her book. struggle in the first book. I mean, that that's oh, yeah. one of my things. Is I love the fact that when she starts off, she makes mistakes. They're pointed out to her, and you're like, "Oh yeah, man, you really kind of you screwed up on that one." Well, <laughs> Don't do that again. So hard to be perfect because everyone's watching, and she knows it. She's trying. And yet nobody's perfect, you know, so. Yeah. Right. But then, she, the you know, she... give her credit, man, to open her eyes to how how flawed her culture is and to be yeah. able to see its weaknesses. And then, of course, in this book, trying to do something about that, trying to push through change that they are not yeah. ready for. No. And she she Any put of herself them. to shame, shameful circumstances or what would have not too long before she would have seen as a shameful uh, can't handle it when she was captured when they were captured in Thurol, you know and they were prisoners that's something mm -hmm. that sarani don't tolerate you know or didn't tolerate until amara comes along you know where she ends in this this book you know it all the growth she's gone through and everything she's succeeded that's why she's my number one female character in fiction she she tops Ooh. nine eve nine, nine eve one. wow yeah I, I i i i've wavered back and forth a number of times on nine eve or her at top but right now it's definitely mara it, i would put a Gwen on top and then mara probably second nine eve's probably okay. fourth or fifth on my list a Gwen's because... up there well you know i've got fail as a real no just kidding guys just no kidding. hey you <laughs> you wouldn't be the first person to say that on the show now bear lane no. oh yeah no kidding i love bear lane i she absolutely love woman. Bear lane. I, I appreciate bear like lane a lot more than than a lot of people do but maybe not you you know you've got uh, it. no i i love bear lane. i appreciate both i appreciate both bear lane and fight now the way she screws the parent well that's not so good yeah. but you know no. it is funny though <laughs> I love Matt. It, it, Matt's big fly is his wife. You know, I, I love Matt, even despite the fact that he's married to the biggest slaver in the entire series. Uh, you know? She doesn't grow to the degree Mara does. See, she's no. still stuck in her Shanchen culture. That, that's yeah. what I admire about uh, Mara, though, is in identifying her own weaknesses, it, it gave her the ability to calculate and sort of dissect her own culture. And then with the influence of Kevin in book two, yep. we get to see her realize, okay, this is where they're better than we are because they're not as rigid on this. And she implements it in this book. But let me just say, chapter one was a absolute gut punch. Mm. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Chapter That's where one her is naiveness a, a little bit still came back to haunt her. She'd gotten past most of it. But here it's like, man, come on. You should have been able to predict something like this a little better 
I mean, they start off with the horse accident, crushing their child. It's it's rough, man. I'm like, geez. Okay, his own. And you know she's not going to take that sitting down. That's ugh. But so something I appreciate about her in this book is not only as you well described, she's seen the weaknesses in her culture. She learns in this book how to use those weaknesses against her enemies. Take advantage of where she knows they're going to go, the lane they're going to take, and just subvert their expectations because she's big enough now not to have to stay stuck in her lane. And that's brilliant. She she just she, does that multiple times in this book with, you know, the, the results that she gets. In she, the does. Plays, she plays the game of council the way Chumaka played Sha or chess, you know, Jiro's, you know, uh, first advisor. Mm-hmm. He, he knows what kinds of moves the person he's playing against is going to do. And he uses that to their advantage. Yep. And it's a very similar thing there. I, I wanted learned... to keep calling him Chewbacca, though. I'm not going to lie. It's so <laughs> close <Yeah. laughs> that my brain says Chewbacca. Every time I would read it or hear it, I'm like, Chewbacca? Yeah. So when you first read this book, well, let's start with you, Bill. Reading this book, who is your favorite character? Oh, I mean, uh, Arakasi. Still... I mean, that's not really a question. I think I like him Arakasi's a little more still... now. Um, he's been humanized a little bit. Um, we got to see uh, some emotion out of him, uh, you know, yeah. with the whole uh, issue that he goes through. And uh, I, I love that guy. I mean, Arakasi's you know, awesome. and, and Mara, of course, but, you know, not Kevin. Pretty much anybody but Kevin. (laughs) That's just... Okay. Now, how about you, Jim? When you first read it, who was your favorite character? You know, by this book, it's Mara. Because of where she's traveled over these last two books. This time, she gets to be my favorite character. And seeing what she overcomes, what she endures, what she is willing to allow herself to do now that, I mean, in book one, book one, Mara couldn't have done these things. No. no. Uh-uh. She's fantastic. In she book. wouldn't have thought of doing them. And, and that's what's great. Right, right. She has transcended the person we first met. Yeah. So yeah, Mara. And my appreciation has only grown for her with time and a reread. Yeah. See, I think, when I first read this trilogy, well, this book, it was still Arakasi after this, you know, after book two. Arakasi is just the best character in book two, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, this, when I first read this, it was probably, it was still, I'm pretty sure it was still Arakasi. This read, though, I, I really liked Hokano. I really enjoyed Hago Hokano. Okay. You know, I, I enjoyed him more this book than last book. Yeah, he's. Really, I mean, he had such a small yeah. part in the last book, but yeah. none, nonetheless, you know, it kind of that it, the epilogue broke my heart for that reason, and, and yeah. I kind of want to punch a good it in stand the face. Up character in this, in this, yeah. Book. yeah. And I mean, yeah. I feel a little cheated for him, even if he doesn't feel that way. I feel that way for him, right? So he'll be yeah, all right. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he, he's got. His we own we all get our hearts broken. Now. I know. You know, I, I am happy, you know, you might not be happy for Mara and Kevin, but can you at least be happy for Justin in the epilogue? Sure. Okay. Emperor Justin. <laughs> Which is oh, not Sarah as Romani. good a gig as one would think. Come on. Uh, yeah. No. I'm like, they don't seem to last very long. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is that. I'm assuming, <laughs> I'm assuming it gets better. You know, with the direction <laughs> she's changed everything towards. It's a start. So, uh, I'll say it's a start. I don't know where they go from here, and uh, I probably will find out because I do plan on at least branching out from here and continuing yeah, you the do series. Find you do. Keep going. All right. There's more to happen. What's next? It's like a Hive Queen? Hive Queen Prince Darkness? Of the Blood. No, you got to read the uh, Prince of the Blood and King's Buccaneer. Are the next two? Do those fit in right here? Man, I don't yes. remember the order. 
I, I, yeah, guess. I don't remember and, either. Um, you're going to leave. What happened? Or right, you're leave right around the Kelly time for a while, and 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 do some other ends. stuff back in before yeah. this element comes back in. Yeah, Prince of the Blood takes place right around the end of this book, I believe, timeline wise. It says Shadow of a Dark Queen. Yeah, that that and takes darkness place a generation. Like, that takes is... like a couple generations. Or later. is that? Or did we already do that? That Darkness of Sethanon. Yeah, we did that. Uh, that was it. That was book. That was three. already yeah. in the original. Man. Yeah, yeah. Hard to remember. In the original Again, trilogy. thirty. Books. I know it is. And most of them are worth reading. Just don't read the one trilogy that he co-wrote with S. M. Sterling, William Fortune, and whoever the other author was. That trilogy was just bad. He doesn't mean don't that read I'm it. He means give it a books. try if you don't like it. Yeah. That's what yeah. he means. Just be, be yeah. Just be warned, I, I found them really bad, and I haven't found anybody who actually liked Honored Enemy, Murder Lamute, or Jimmy the Hand. And I oh, love the character. He co wrote those? He co wrote those. Oh, no, I've read those. I didn't have a problem with those, but uh, there's, there's a definite like shift in style for those, so that makes sense. They're not I my favorite, like but they add a, they add some elements, some texture, especially a little Jimmy bit of the flavor. Hand. That's my favorite. Jimmy the Hand was probably the best of the three, but that was because it's about Jimmy. Mm -hmm. And I'm a fan of S.M. Sterling's stuff. You know, his uh, Emberverse, Dies the Fire and all that series. It's uh, post-apocalyptic. You might like it if you haven't read it. Uh, may have to no check zombies, that out. Though. No zombies. Just all, but that's all okay. Post-apocalyptic yeah. is, is all good, even if there aren't yeah. zombies. <laughs> Revolution, the TV series Revolution, kind of stole some of it. Um, uh, electricity. Imagine electricity just stops working, and gunpowder and explosives stop working. Okay, wow. Everything Revolution was a great show, by the way. Did you guys? Uh, I know, I enjoyed that? that show. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, good show. So, Jim, this is one for you and me. What if any? What things, if any, had you forgotten since your first read of this book? That pleasantly sub, sub, yeah, surprised you when you read reread it. I had forgotten all about Camlio, and, and everything dealing with her and Arakasi falling for her. It, when I got to that, when they introduced her in the book, I'm like, I don't remember this at all. I remember him going after the Hamoy Tong. I just didn't remember her uh, for some reason. But it had been twenty some odd years since I'd read the book. Yeah, so. exactly. Uh, for me, it was just Mara's growth as a character. I I did not value her as much the first time I read the trilogy. So reading this book again, I'm like, oh, she's good. She she really made, you know, I did not remember that. I, I think I was, again, the first time reading it, I wanted to get it done so I could get to the next stuff, the good stuff. And, and I didn't value this to the degree I should have. So seeing how robust a character Mara had become in this book. I, I hadn't remember I had not remembered that. So that was a little surprise for me. And very pleasant. Was there anything that stood out for you, Bill? That um I love the Arakasi you know, bit. I mean, you know, like I said, it, it kind of gave us a more humanizing look at, at the spy master as opposed to just his, you know, his his wheelings and dealings is all we've really gotten from him in the, the other two books. So to get a get a peek beneath the mask and see the human being underneath it, I enjoyed those portions. Um, yeah, so that section really stood out for me. So that's cool. Here's one that's always going to be interesting, especially with older books. Are there any elements of this book that clash with today's social and/or political climate? that were problematic for you in any way well i mean let's just state slavery well we all agree slavery yeah. is a horrible thing um and we do this every book that we do in this world so, yeah. number one is slavery we we all know that so but we can but can we say something on. there in yeah. this book in this series it doesn't portray slavery as something to uphold as this is the way life should be it very oh, yeah. clearly is poking the issue of slavery is wrong. Oh, hundred percent. It's, it's part of the culture there. It's wrong, you know, and that that's been a huge, especially in book two, but you know, a huge element of this trilogy. 
So, you know, I don't have such an issue then. Well, I don't have an issue with it. It just doesn't clash with today's sort of uh, modern thought. We can all agree slavery is bad. So having it in any book, we're going to mention slavery is bad. We don't enjoy that part. (laughs) That's not a part anybody should enjoy. I say the same thing for Wheel of Time and every other book that I come across that has it. That's just a blanket statement of, okay, slavery, bad. Something I appreciate about this, because I didn't have anything that really strongly clashes for me here with modern culture. What I appreciate is how well it leaned on ancient Far Eastern culture without appropriating, you know, without Mm -hmm. really misrepresenting. I mean, it leaned into certain elements of it really authentically when you look at the Mm -hmm. historical, you know, documentation um there are things in ancient far eastern culture china japan etc that some of these things yes this is how they how they conducted things and it had its values its good aspects and it also had its flaws and all of that's portrayed really well by feist and wurtz here so they they did some tremendous research i felt to do this well and i think it still holds up I I agree. I love the fact that they were able to to not only do it without making it a character of itself, but they were able to fuse different ones together because you'll get flavors of uh, Filipina, you'll get flavors of Japan, you'll get flavors of China, and Mm -hmm. and it's just blended into this delicious goulash of yummy words. Nice. So, I mean, and it's done well, which is what makes me happy. And it's even got influences from other parts of the world too. You know, mm-hmm. Yeah, it on does. Previous um, episodes talking about this, we it brought uh, Mesoamerica has been brought up. Yeah. You know, th- there's a very Aztec element to it. I think um, the one I always liked, always thought when I was a teenager, when when I in early twenties when I was reading these the first times, uh, the other one was uh, Klingons. You know, I've mentioned that a couple of times now, but I, I, I see a bit of Klingons. Always brings up the Klingons. Yeah, they just, they always remind me of Klingons to some extent, you know. Nice. The Klingons are a little bit more emotional, though, you know, but, uh, but yeah, it, I don't really have anything. This is, this is a series that didn't have as many problems aging for me. Yeah. You know? Especially yeah. as the trilogy progressed, because it was bringing a culture that is back assworts. And it's changing and developing and becoming something more mature and something that wouldn't be as offensive to the modern eye, the modern mm-hmm. Western eye, at least, you know, you know, but yeah, so, you know, something I, I, think I can highlight here is my son and co-host has just finished or is just finishing the initial saga and then is going to move into these and as he's read that initial rift war saga he's hated the fact that he's been impressed with how modern it kind of feels in the way it's written it doesn't feel like old fantasy because he doesn't like a lot of the older stuff that i enjoyed because it's like well you know it has an age he's like this holds up and i'm like he's gonna find the same when he gets here it holds up has he read earth sea he has not i was about to say i would love to hear his thoughts on earth sea because in a way it's kind of old but at the same time the prose is so beautiful that i lose myself in it when i read Uh, it so i i I won't let him near i won't let him near david eddings though sorry that that doesn't no that's fine no no worries there i haven't read (laughs) i haven't read david eddings in 30 some i don't think i've read david eddings since the last book in the Tumuli came out. Well, I missed I, him altogether, I, but I read the Belgariad last year and I was like, Oh, those are kids. Oh, books. Mm. It's painful yeah. to get through now. I wish yeah. I had had it back when it was fresh. Cause I think I would have loved I, it. It doesn't quite work anymore. At some point. It's not like me reading, reading Canterbury tales. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I tried to read that last year and I did it's not rough. have any luck. <laughs> yeah, I I was doing it because I wanted to do it as research because I was like, you know, 
doing something you know not a, a complete clone of Canterbury Tales, but you know, using that you know that storytelling idea you know you know format. It, it has potential, you know. A lot of people have used it at different times, and it's been successful. Um, you guys recently on your channel talked about a book that is sort of based off the Canterbury Tales when you talked about Hyperion. Oh yes, uh, very, yes, very much. So. Very much a science fiction, which I haven't read yet. Version. It's coming up this year, but Zach okay, loved it. Was, that's right. It was just Zach who read that. We I, have an episode yeah, coming out that. on its follow up too, the Fall of Hyperion. That'll be dropping later this week. Next nice. week, cool. sometime close. Looking forward to that. I'll watch that, even though I never did finish Hyperion. Speaking of which, if you look up in the corner right now, you should see a card for his channel. Fantasy for right the here, ages. Right here. He's no, no it's over here. Uh, it's it's right over. We're up. we're on the race oh, for a okay. thousand subscribers. We're got a little bit to go still. We're about to hit eight hundred right now, but nice. we we've added oh. one hundred and fifty just in the last month. So it's coming. It's nice. coming. Critical mass. Good. Getting there. But be there to celebrate with you. I'm rooting for you on that. I've been following you guys for a while. You are one of my favorite channels to watch. We and do I don't want to watch you. a lot in the in the book. I don't watch a lot in the booktube area, you know, zone. I do. Or, a uh, lot. the fantasy science fiction community <laughs> much anymore. I hardly watch any YouTube anymore. It's all listening to audiobooks nowadays. And like maybe an hour or two of television a week. That may be why I'm behind on the expanse, YouTube. Just saying. Yeah. That is the challenge, yeah. though. When you're a content creator, how do you find time to watch other people's content when you're trying to consume stuff to be able to make content? Yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a challenge. Yep. It's and the, the well, you guys are one of the few channels that I do still consume, and I like to leave you lots of comments too. Can I you know. say watch you consume? Like sounds that. very cannibalistic. <laughs> Some fiber beans. <laughs> so, what if any are some themes and or character flaws that you notice now that you may have missed in your previous reading of this book? Or Bill, what are some what are some that stood out to you that you would like to bring up? Anybody? I mean <sighs> As far as character flaws, I mean, at the beginning of the book, Maya is a little naive still when she should know better at this point. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not blaming her for what happened at all. That's not what I'm saying. No, no, I'm no, just no. saying, you know, I, I think there was a degree of cautiousness that should have been there that wasn't. Um, so we get to see her overcome that. Um, her taste in men is pretty horrible in the end. Um, I'm going to say that. <laughs> Um, yeah, those are my big two. <laughs> she she's a little ungrateful because you know the first two books, she wins basically in the end of both the first two books because of what the black robes do, and now here she goes and stabs the black robes in the back. Eh. No, no, not buying eh. it. No, 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 no. It's I like do think it's weird though. Get on the board first two books, or get out of her way. Yeah, that's it, how it, it is. I do think it's funny though. Book. The first two books, at the end, it, a, a part, big part of why she wins is decisions made by great ones. And, and then this book, she is fighting. And, and she needed to go against them because they're terrible. You know, they're as bad as the Sarani lords were themselves. But I, I do think it's funny that they helped her win, they helped her win, and now she defeats them. And I just, I enjoy well, that. Here's the thing. They wanted to keep the culture stagnant in order to maintain power. Oh, yeah. And that is not okay <laughs> on oh, any I, level I agree. for anyone. So, I mean, no. the fact that they did help her out in the past doesn't okay kind of going, well, I, now you owe us I one. Was... So stand there and let things be the way they are instead of, right. you know, changing and making improvements that you see can make life better. So I, I don't see fantastic. it as... I, I hope so. Because I'm stabbing her in the back. Uh, all right, I good. Being <laughs> because yeah. I'm like, no. <laughs> no. I'll give you but a theme. It is a pattern that stuck stuck out to me, though. A theme that I see, and it's it's a, man, it's a harsh theme, but altruism is rare. Everyone's motivated in this book by what's in it for me. And Even it's rarely Laura, fruitful. She's really trying to 
take care of her family, protect herself, move the culture forward because it's going to be better for the Akoma. You know, that that's mm-hmm. really the motivation. Very rarely, it does happen, but very rarely is someone doing something genuinely for the better of others. It's it's always what's in it for me. That, that's yeah. that's part of their culture. And, it's and hard yeah. to overcome that. And there's very and what will bring me right. honor as opposed to what will bring us honor. You know, or that what difference. will make us safe. You know, where yeah. will we finally be safer? And you know, well, it, we'll do whatever we have to do. I'm like, it's Calibon. Sure ain't nothing we safe. Are safe. <laughs> They're at the Which, end. You know, Mara called I know. for something I know what you that. Mean. The, the word I don't think had really been used. I'm not even sure if the word would be in the Sarani language, you know, to be honest. And that's justice. You know, she was calling for it's time that the Empire Saranawani had mm. justice. You know, and she brought that. And the only other time I remember that being that word being used was in book two. I think Kevin said it at one point. Was talking about there's no justice. Or, you know, you have no sense of justice or something like that. And they didn't. You know, but, no, no, I mean, it's all about it, honor. And they're just starting respect. To. Yeah, they had just... just us, you know, you know, is what it was. Nice. You know, but... When you have a culture, I, I, I think that basically people can walk in and assassinate people. And as long as everybody agrees, I see no knives. It's not a big deal. There's something wrong. Yeah. When everybody yeah. knows bad things are going to happen, but that's in the background and, and on the surface is we're all being proper and honorable. I mean, that's built yeah. in. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've had uh, quite a bit to say in the previous two episodes on this trilogy. And even back when we talked about the Rift War trilogy, about the Sarani sense of honor and how I see them as not really having had any honor to begin with. This book kind of, I, I, I've tried to make the point that the more honor, the honor should be one of those qualities that the more of it you have the more it protects itself that if you have a great amount of honor like um, like mara had she's not going to be shamed and insulted nearly as much by being taken prisoner as somebody who has shit for honor you know jiro would not have handled being a prisoner of the thuro and he would have shown that he ain't got any honor mm-hmm. he doesn't have any pride and nobility when he can't handle a little bit of an insult, he couldn't handle you the You can't insult handle game. the truth. <laughs> exactly. That's yeah. what I was thinking too. The, 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 the <laughs> thorough game of, you know, insults, you know, uh, of it, it's an art form. Most Sarani would freaking flip out. They, they couldn't right? handle that. And, you know, it's because they have so little honor. They, ha- they think they have great honor, but they had none. And I think honor is finally being introduced to this society. To this this civilization for the first I, well, time in hundreds or not, if not thousands of years i think honor is a a sort of uh personal made-up thing depending on your culture and your values i mean you know yeah. if i'm in a biker gang my honor may demand that i you know do something horrible but at the same time that's honorable in their world it's not mm-hmm. in mine i'm just saying so it, it's subjective depending on your world and your culture and your values. Yeah. And so I'm without coming at it from a base of values, world. you can't have honor. Yeah, good point. And, and I am coming at it from a very, very biased standpoint. You know, our modern world does not look on their sense of honor. At least the people I know don't have an honor system like that you know a sense of honor that like coming from a biased point of view that's what we're here for people we have opinions and guess what everybody's allowed to have them even if you don't like them that's right they have every right to be wrong (laughs) (laughs) and that's how they look at it (laughs) exactly exactly anything else anybody wanted to bring up about this book or the trilogy I love the trilogy and, um, you know, I I was really dragging my feet on reading this, as you know, and I am so happy you made me read it. So thank you, Glenn. Uh, I really, really enjoyed this way more than I thought I would. And I love that. And I appreciate being invited on because likewise, really enjoyed it. 
coming back into it after so many years. Um, appreciate it so much more now than when I first read it. So the last question I have is, who would you recommend this to, or who wouldn't you? Older groups, older demographics, younger, both? 13 I'd and above. Pretty much any, yep, exactly. Teens on up. That's exactly what yeah. I was thinking. Yeah. Teens There's some up. mature content and topics in here that mid-level, 10-year-old? Mm -mm, no. No, no. Know there yet. no. Like I said for the last book, I, I wouldn't give it to somebody else's kid that was younger than 15. Not yeah. without the parent knowing what's in the book first. You now, know, again, I was I a seven-year-old like, reading Jaws, so maybe I That's what I'd say. say. You know, that, right. Jaws, the book is different, guys, than the movie. <laughs> there's adultery. There's a whole plot line. Ooh, it's a there's, thing. there's stuff. Was... Mommy, what does this mean? Give me that book <laughs> back. I'm like, yeah, that, that shark in the ocean is not the only shark. <laughs> Just to add a line from uh, one of the Expanse books popped in my head. Daddy, what's a whore? A type of frost. And it's just <laughs> not wrong. <laughs> Horror Frost, Horror Frost. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I keep I keep pausing on that line every time I hear that line. I'm just like, <laughs> that is just such the best answer I've ever heard for a Calvin and Hobbes like answer, that. man. It's great. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> well, Jim, thank you for coming on. Thank you for helping us close out this trilogy. We will have you on for more stuff down the line. Awesome. So. Bill, thanks for agreeing to do this show with me. I, this channel wouldn't exist without you. So, Well, well, thank without you. you. So thank you, Glenn, for doing this every three thank weeks and working around my schedule, which, you know, I do appreciate. Yep. And we will probably be taking a week off in three weeks. Just so those of you at home don't, aren't surprised if we don't put a video out. We will be coming back three weeks after that. If we do put out a video in three weeks, hey, you get it then but uh, we're looking at putting that one off for a couple for a little while just to give us some time off we've got a lot of reading to catch up on all of this so it's always so much thanks for watching please come back in three weeks or six weeks and don't forget to be awesome